Hello, Lawrence. How are you, my friend? Uh, I can hear you very distant. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Can Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. So, you, I think if you speak relatively close to the microphone, it should be good, but can we try? Okay, so uh, let me try that. Is this any better? This is way better. Thank you, friend. Uh, we're waiting. Oh, we have Mason now. Um, as soon as he's able, we, we'll, we'll see how his voice sounds and we'll equalize you. Uh, I think we're not waiting for our, our Inola, are we? Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing any response from her yet, so I, I guess we might have to go ahead if she doesn't show up. And here is Mason. Hello, Mr. Hello, Cole. colleagues. Can you speak with me for, for a little bit so I can hear your voice? Uh, hello, Mark. Do you hear me well? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, can you speak with, with us again, Lawrence, just a few words? Yes, so uh, this is Lawrence. Uh, I'm sure you can hear me. Yes, it sounds very good. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, right. I'll just wait a little bit. I'll, I'll set I'll set up here because I just got to the room, and then we'll, we'll be able to start on time. Great. Thanks, Mark. Panelists, in case we end up not being joined by Arinola, feel free to expand your your talking points uh, slightly, uh, only if you want. Uh, after all, it's a words of a feather, we can talk kind of freely. But if it's just the three of us, feel free to expand your points a little, okay?
Thank you everyone joining online and in person. We'll start in three minutes at the top of the hour. Thank you very much for being with us. So, in my clock, it says it's 6 in Ethiopia, which means it's time for our session. I would like to ask our friends from tech if we're good. Are we good to go? So, perfect. I declare the session started. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure. This is a kind of a unique opportunity. It's the first time that the business constituency from ICANN is hosting a panel at the IGF. So to us, it's a, it's a minor accomplishment, but still one that we're very happy about. Um, we're here to discuss DNS abuse. It's a topic that's very dear to us. It's been uh, a pet peeve of, of, our, of our chairman, Mason Cole, so to say. And in very general lines, what DNS abuse is, for those who, who don't follow this very closely, is when you take the DNS and you make very weird things with it that you shouldn't be doing. That's the, let's say, the formal definition of it. Um, this can take place in many ways. The, the ones that we look into the most are exactly distribution of malware, uh, operation of command and control botnets, which basically you use the DNS and many domain names to instruct uh, malicious machines to do harm, such as in uh, denial of service attacks. We also consider phishing or otherwise misleading domain names to be uh, part of DNS abuse. And all of these matters have been unaddressed for quite a bit. And we're finally being able to, within the icon sphere, take some action, get a move on, and actually generate some results. Uh, and that's why exactly I'll, I'll call on Mason to kind of give us a bit of a history lesson. Uh, this is has been his mission for a long time to get this uh, kind of started. Uh, it's been very interesting to see it develop. So, Mason, can you give us some general insights on what this has looked like historically, like what's going on, how we got here? 
Thanks very much, Mark. Do you hear me well? Loud and clear. Thank you. Well, first, let me just say it's a pleasure to be with everybody here uh, at IGF. Uh, good, very early morning from the West Coast of the United States. Uh, my name is Mason Cole. I'm chair of the business constituency at ICANN, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you all today. So thank you for the opportunity to, to, uh, to address this session. So following up on what Mark uh, just introduced, uh, let me just talk about a bit about what the BC's involvement has been in DNS abuse. Um, the business constituency has long worked on the issue of DNS abuse and has been active on this, uh, advocating for industry and regulatory action since at least 2018. So since uh, the current administration took the chair in 2020, uh, the, this BC administration has prioritized action on DNS abuse as a desired outcome from, from BC participation in the ICANN sphere. So um, our objective has been twofold. One is reduce the incidence of DNS abuse. And second, and equally important, <clears throat> equip ICANN's compliance department with the tools it says it needs, but currently lacks, to enforce against domain name registrars and registries that intentionally harbor those who abuse the domain name system. So uh, we have a, a two-pronged approach that, that we've pursued now for the past probably five years or so. Now, why is DNS abuse of concern? Well, the BC's goal is well justified because the incidences of DNS abuse have been steadily rising over the years, no matter really what, by what objective measure you can implement. Um, so multiple examinations of the market and the DNS confirm this is the case. Even in 2022 alone, Global cyber attacks increased by 28% in the third quarter of 2022 compared to the same period in 2021. In the second quarter of 2022, the anti-phishing working group observed 1.1 million phishing attacks, which is a new record and the worst quarter they've seen for phishing since APWG has ever observed. And according to Interisle, uh, which is an industry research group, there are 1,199 accredited domain name registrars that currently host malware related domain names. So uh, we have a situation in the DNS where there's uh, a great deal of difficulty in um, dealing with DNS abuse. Uh, the cases are on the rise and uh, ICANN is in, in a unique position to help us do something about it. So first, what's the industry's answer been to DNS abuse? Well, um, there have been a couple of positive steps. There have been uh, things like the DNS Abuse Institute, the DNS abuse framework, uh, other frameworks that contracted parties, meaning registrars and registries, have signed on to that uh, will help mitigate DNS abuse. And these are applaudable, but they do shut, they stop short of dealing with uh, the contracted parties that turn a blind eye to, toward abusers of the DNS. So what we're looking for from ICANN's compliance function, and as it has said many times over the years, that compliance function needs better contractual tools for holding rogue contracted parties accountable for intentionally harboring abuse. So let me turn to the questions that were posed by IGF uh, in advance of our session. Number one, what are the trends in DNS abuse and how can the available data be interpreted considering different data sources and the types of abuse that exist? Well, again, uh, trends are increasing. I mean, the BC has looked at data from anti-phishing working group the Messaging Malware Mobile Anti-Abuse Working Group, known as MOG, uh, Interisle Checkpoint Security, Sonic Wall, the FBI Cybercrime Information Center, the European Union Study on DNS Abuse published earlier this year, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, Google Cloud, Krebs on Security, ARS Technica, Palo Alto Networks, you name it, we've looked at data sources that have uh, informed us about the level of DNS abuse and all are reporting worrying increases in cybercrime trends. So where does that leave us? Well, unfortunately, ICANN orders reporting on DNS abuse is kind of an outlier because they, they have said that DNS abuse is on, on a downward trend. We respectfully disagree uh, because most cybersecurity authorities that we consult with report that online abuse and misuse of the DNS is actually at an all-time high. Question number two, I'll how can the internet effects, community Mason? effectively collaborate to ensure that abuse Mason? rates 
decrease in a consistent Mason. manner. Mason, well, can I stop you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you kindly. Uh, I want to give it to Lawrence, then give it back to you. Does that make sense? Please. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's a bit of a, bit of a fatter thing. It's supposed to be like more informal. We don't need to be as formal as usual. Uh, but okay. Thank you. Know, you. Perfect introduction, like great introduction, actually, like complemented it much better than I could. Uh, Lawrence, can you give us a bit of a of a perspective? You you're our, our local guy, right? Like you're speaking to us straight from the 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 Abuja hub, and it would be great to to hear more uh, about everything that 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 has been going on. You are the 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 BC's vice president for for finances. And definitely, you have a very, uh, I would say, very keen perspective on the subject. Can you give us some ideas? Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, that was lovely, uh, a startup from uh, Mason. And uh, my name is Lawrence Olali Roberts. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Mark. And I'm speaking to you today from the uh, remote hub of the IGF in Abuja, which happens to be the capital. Uh, city of Nigeria. This hub has, for the past five years, uh, received support from the business constituency of ICANN uh, to keep it live for a week. And uh, there was a time where we definitely had two weeks of IGF meeting during the, the COVID, if you still remember that period. And yes, uh, we still had our doors uh, open. Uh, to the topic uh, on ground, uh, so first of all, um, DNS abuse is definitely a global trend. It's not something that, that uh, to some extent affects uh, a region over the others. And uh, here in the Global South, um, we definitely have had our fair share of it. Um, just before 2019, when uh, GDPR hit and you know the whois went dark, uh, we had been having some series of problems uh, in terms of accuracy of registrant data. And the practice in Africa, which is very much uh, like what happens in the global south, is that uh, we have a lot of great resellers who piggy bank on the infrastructure and the backbone of you know, major DNS players uh, to resell domain names. And in the process of doing this as resellers, they not only uh, try to um, automate the system, but to a large extent, it's still a manual process. And so what we see happen is a situation where uh, the resellers, the local resellers, on one hand, trying to ensure that they don't give out too much information to their competitors, um, use their own data, their own um, personal information to register the domains rather than the registrants. And to some extent, uh, this feeds back into what our quote-unquote, the big players, the registrars, the contracted parties uh, get to keep at the back end as the information they have. So we, had had, we have been having issues around accuracy of registrant data. And this is very important. I also happen to play in the uh, CCTLD space here and to a large extent see issues where um, law enforcement get when they cannot reach a registrant who has done something funny on the net, you know, will go um, into the who is to pick out the records of whoever was there to you know at least have someone to um to to reach or to accept with regards to that domain now that is bad enough as it is uh but when we had the gtpr hit us it's mandated that personal information had to be redacted and that again provided another layer of challenges because the who is went dark so with this happening you are not i mean to where you have all forms of abuse happening due to bad actors. We basically like open the doors, open the gateway for bad actors to freely act because the tool that the community uses, uh, that the public uses to be able to, you know, monitor what's happening with regards to the domain or, you know, have some form of enforcement uh, take place has been taken off the radar. And so, um, I, oh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I concur with what Mason has said earlier on with regards to you know, the claim that abuse is going down. Uh, I actually feel that abuse has you know, increased 
because of the situations that we found ourselves with, um, with a legitimate uh, call for GDPR having to take the who is off, um, off the streets, if I will use that word. Um, I will give the floor back to, um, to Mark or to Mason, and then uh, I can uh, maybe go further in subsequent uh, opportunities to talk about how this especially affects uh, the African and the Global South uh, as a whole. That's beautiful, Lawrence. Thank you for bringing this perspective. This is exactly what I think is one of the the great strengths of our group is that we are we have a lot of representation in the global north, a lot in the global south. That's why I think we 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 accomplish a lot. Uh, we have uh, thankfully a lot of guests here in the room, and you know it's a birds of a feather session. Uh, we don't need to follow a big structure. Would anybody like to add any comments, or should we move on with with, with our speakers? Does anybody have? interests, stories, experiences, or perspectives. If not, we can move on, but my, our good friend Savio from Brazil, our tech representative, please go on. Uh, well, I just would like to know, uh, I, I'm, my name is Savio, I'm here as part of the Brazilian Youth Program. Uh, I have a technical background. They have some, uh, also some actuation in, in ICANN, uh, mostly under the International Allied Domain Name. And I would like basically to know what are your main battlefronts in terms of, of fighting uh, the DNS the abuse in terms of your work. Thank you, Savio. That, that's actually really interesting because you know, coming from your your background of IDNs, uh, international domain names, and universal acceptance, that that used to be a, a, a big concern, right? Like, how do you abuse uh, internationalized names uh, to to actually exploit the DNS? But those have been going down significantly because so much work has been done by the cybersecurity community to stop script mix, script mixing. Maybe this is something. Edmund can 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 pitch some extra about or not? I don't know. Don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe something you can say a little more about. But so that concern has kind of gone away, and it has become these actors that they can benefit from different things like new TLDs, top level domains. They can sometimes sell domains for very cheap to make their strategies work. So if your TLD is not doing so well, you can go and give them away for free, as it, as it had happened in, at times, or like for very cheap, to kind of justify your, your, your investment. But then it comes to the situation where it's like, okay, it's free, this is potentially good, but who thinks this is even better? Malicious actors, right? Let's, let's register 10,000 domains here and, and use it for, for our botnets, you know? So I wonder if any of our, our remote panelists ha have uh, an impression on this. Mason, Lawrence, over to you, Mason. Uh, I defer to Lawrence to begin. Thank you, Mason. So yes, um, what you say is actually very true. Um, there has been there has been this uh, trend, so to say, uh, for uh, where we have a lot more abuse happening around the uh, TLDs that are given out for free or. Um, quite cheap. We have a number of registries that uh, will give a lot of bonanzas. Uh, you can get their TLDs for less, for close to a dollar, uh, if you will, you know, uh, buy for over a long period in time. And um, uh, I will give a case in point. Uh, and this happens to be a personal, um, personal experience. So um, I got a, I got a couple of friends reaching out to me to say. Uh, we found something on the net, um, and the story isn't quite, it's quite unsettling for us. And so they sent me the, um, the link to this particular website uh, on, a, uh, on one of our new uh, GTLD brands. And that particular domain was uh, marketing some, some form of um, enhancement product and had my picture um, and a story that was accredited to me. The, the picture was clearly mine, um, but the, the story was quite, um, was, was, wasn't quite aligning. 
because the location where the person claimed to live, the age and all that didn't match with mine. But the, but the bottom line still um, remains that this was me looking at my picture on a site, selling a product that I had nothing, um, no kind of connection to, uh, yet, uh, more or less, one couldn't do anything about it. So I reached out to uh, the, um, the, the registry, uh, the, the guys behind that particular TLD, to say, well, I've seen this about me, this is not about me, and I want it taken down. The registry reaches back to me. I'm talking about something um, in the range of about three, four months ago. So it's a very recent case. The registry reaches back to me to say, uh, we just sell domains. There's nothing else we can do about this. Take it up with a uh, hosting company. And so I write to the hosting company um, somewhere in uh, South America, and they're getting back to me to say, uh, I, don't, I cannot tell who is behind this domain as we speak, because the who is uh, records has already been redacted, all thanks to GDPR. Uh, so I don't have a direct contact to reach in whoever the abusers are. But the hosting company gets back to me to say, um, we will advise that you, um, you, know, you get a court, uh, what's that word called? I, I can't remember again. But you know, I should start the process in court where they are able to even divulge to me the guys behind the domain name. So I'm, I'm, I'm not wondering, am I supposed to uh, set up this process, this judicial process in my region here in Africa? Will it apply to them? Or am I supposed to find a lawyer in their jurisdiction somewhere in South America where I am not uh, so familiar with and which will definitely cost me an arm and a leg to be able to get information about the actors behind this domain name. This is the kind of frustration, you know, that uh, people will have to endure on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is why I also believe that, you know, DNS abuse has to be dealt with decisively. It might, uh, we might have different reasons why we feel it's not in our remit, it's not in our space, but these are real life issues that um, impact on not just the registrant itself, it impacts on lives, on, on human, real human lives, on business, on everyday living. Um, Mason, I would yield the floor back to you at this point. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Mark, if I may. Please go ahead. Thank you. So I agree 100% with Lawrence that there is a direct correlation between um, <clears throat> low cost sellers of domain names and the incidences of abuse. We've seen this now repeated for the past, I don't know, decades now, uh, where uh, you have um, uh, problem behaviors within uh, registrars, things like multiple bulk registrations. Uh, you have um, uh, uh, domain names that are sold for a dollar or less. And uh, these kinds of uh, circumstances afford uh, DNS abusers the opportunity to leverage the domain name system to carry out uh, whatever program they're trying to carry out to, to, um, to, to, to carry out a nefarious scheme. So uh, it is, there is evidence in the marketplace that shows that, that low-cost providers of domain names tend to harbor more DNS abuse. Uh, same is the case with top-level domains that uh, low-cost TLDs uh, tend to find more incidences of DNS abuse. And I know this is a, 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 a critical discussion point within the ICANN sphere about whether or not uh, to try to do something about that, but but it is a data point within DNS abuse that we need to address. That that low cost providers are um, disproportionately uh, housing difficult domain names. Mark, back to you. Thank you very much to both of you. This is actually pretty enlightening. I would like to ask if anybody from the online pan uh, from the online audience or anybody from the in person audience here would like to add anything or proceed with the question. Edmund, please. Hi, um, Edmund here, <clears throat> speaking as an IGF participant. Uh, very, very, thank you very much for uh, uh, a very interesting case, uh, Lawrence, uh, um, and 
very disturbing, for sure. Um, I think those are some of the the issues that that um, I, not only I can, but but beyond I can community probably need to work on. What I what I did want to raise as a kind of question is that I I've I've heard of, you know, there's this this relation between the GDPR and the redaction of some of the Whois uh, fields uh, in terms of abuse. But um, in the past, when I asked for additional information about it, usually it there there doesn't seem to be much information like data on 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 the actual correlation and there's also a counter or argument that you know if a bad actor is registering name they wouldn't use real information anyway so uh whether you have the the whole information or not uh shouldn't make a big difference so just want to get a sense of what what you think about that and you know uh, uh why you know why a bad actor wouldn't give you know, bad information anyway, if, if, you know, even if the who is information was shown. I think our, our local expert on this is Mason, but I will give just a first scratch of that. Um, remembering everything that, you know, I discussed with Microsoft security team, which are pretty much, you know, some of the people who do a lot of work on DNS uh, abuse pr protection. Um, even when you're using mal uh, malicious generated data, you can still find patterns there. You can still find a general trend in there, which does not exactly solve the issue, but it gives you a direction to go towards. But I will point specifically towards Mason here, who is our, our overall expert on this. Mason, please. Thanks, Mark. I, I think I caught most of Edmund's question, but if, if I understand the question correctly uh, or the, the comment, uh, it has to do with whether or not um, the redaction of who is data uh, has really had that significant an impact on the investigatory capability of rooting out DNS abuse. Um, I would say that, yes, uh, since 2018, when who is uh, was massively redacted, uh, I think any cybersecurity authority or any um, any person that speaks with credibility over the security of the DNS would tell you that the difficulty around investigating uh, DNS abuse because of the redaction of who is has contributed to the increase in DNS abuse over time. And we have a situation now where, um, uh, you know, even if uh you've got uh, a domain name that is uh being used for nefarious purposes or uh or whatever and you've got um uh a dark who is record uh mark is correct it, it there is the ability to suss out patterns and uh otherwise even with a sliver of data be able to find um uh, some data that would be helpful in the investigatory, in investigatory sense. So I don't necessarily buy the argument that that redaction of who is data has not uh, contributed to the incidences of DNS abuse. I believe that's actually the case. If that weren't the case, I don't think we would see the upward trend lines that we do in DNS abuse now. So I hope that's helpful, Mark. Uh, it is very helpful. Uh, would you like to, to answer that, Edmund? Yeah, just quickly on that. Yeah, I I, I don't disagree with uh, what, what was said, and uh, especially in the investigation, and especially in research, and and uh, uh, and pattern matching, and those kind of the uh, uh, things. I guess what I wanted to raise is that you know, for a specific case like uh, uh, like Lauren's situation, it doesn't you know, uh, on a specific case, it doesn't necessarily matter that much. Uh, but yes, I, I I totally agree in terms of the the larger scheme of things um, that. I don't. Uh, yeah. So I I agree with that. Yeah, uh, and and that kind of dovetails into kind of the 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 big announcement here. It's it's not a big announcement because it's been going on since the start of the year, but um, it's not everyone here may know we have managed to achieve a bit of a landmark in the Icon community. Now we had a small team uh coming from the the council for generic names, the GNSO council in which we got together all stakeholders, representatives from literally every ICON stakeholder, and we came together with the idea of how do we address this in some way that's more immediate, that doesn't require us to be talking about this forever. And 
very recently we delivered a report uh, specifying some basic changes to icon contracts that could be helpful and our friends from the contractor party house the the registers and registrars were very kind in replying almost immediately to that saying they are starting an internal negotiation now to change some of the provisions around the ns abuse so that our, our combat is more effective and to me what this represents is we are we were able to take an issue that's very pressing and actually work as a community and achieve something meaningful, leaving aside some of the other questions. The who is fight, you know, it will rage on, but now we'll be able to actually have some basic measures of control in which pretty much the, 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 the big change that we're, we're, we're seeking here in this renegotiation of contracts is that the, the registrar, the one who sells the domain name, actually has to do something about a complaint. Right now, what we found out after a year of inquiry with, uh, with ICANN compliance, as Mason was, was mentioning, we've been talking to them a lot, is that they can write very strongly worded letters saying that this is wrong. And that's not exactly where we want to be in today's landscape. You want them to have some kind of capability to react to that. And we're hopeful that next year, we'll be able to actually get this rolling. Things are, are in place, so it's actually looking pretty good. Um, this is a very short, short session. It's more of a networking thing. I would like to, again, open the floor to any of our virtual or in-person participants um, to express anything, or otherwise, I would just huddle with my panelists for us to wrap up. Any final impressions, anyone? At the end of the table, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yasin from uh, .sd Registry CCTLD from Sudan. Uh, from Sudan. Uh, actually, we can't blame uh, the registrar or the registries for the most fishing uh, that is going on. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, to run like uh, more awareness uh, uh, issues uh, for the people. Uh, they are owning the domain itself. Because uh, recently, most websites that are uh, being uh, phishing or attack, uh, acting like phishing website, uh, because they are old website design it, and no one is coming back for them. So especially uh, like WordPress website, there is old plugin that uh, bad guys are using them for attacking uh, those websites. So uh, there must be uh, a way that we can uh, do awareness for the people for the owners of the domain through the media, through the uh, social uh, media, so they can uh, be aware of what is going on. Uh, I actually think you're 100% correct. And in that report from the GNSO Council, there's a recommendation that's exactly that. So thank you for, you know, bringing it back to that point. Uh, another impression from the room, please, sir. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Benedict Segu from Ghana Dominion Registry. I just want to add on to what he said. What we do in Ghana, because people don't add value and importance to domain names, what we do is we partner the local, we, we partner the local intellectual property groups and, and other organizations to drive home the importance of updating your who is record to the owner. So that if there's any abuse or anything and you want us to take it down, you will know who is the real owner and then the kind of measure we can take to also support the person. I think I'm just adding out to the this part. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think here we see the the difference between generics and CCs, right? CCs can pretty much write their own rules and often <laughs> to the favor of the internet community, right? Uh, yes, please do. Also, before two or three years, uh, when there is ISIS and around the world and making a big uh, trouble, uh, one of the client uh, registered it from uh, one of our registered domain name, and immediately the second day they put a lot of media about ISIS. Uh, we are the registrar, uh, the registry. We can't monitor all the thousands of these domain. So the community uh, uh, has to be involved with and. Uh, one of uh, the people that uh, reached us and said, I found a website that is uh, announcing something for ISIS. 
So you have to take it down. Then after that, we review the website and contact the registrar and we take down uh, that website immediately. So I think the community has a great uh, part in uh, this. We have to, they have to be involved uh, way or another. With 100% agreement with that, we are unfortunately pressed for time. So I would like to invite our panelists to give a 30 seconds final uh, recommendation, speech, comment, or joke, uh, starting with Mr. Mason Cole. Thanks, Mark. I don't have really much more to add except just to say that I appreciate uh, IGF's attention on the issue of domain name abuse. Uh, I appreciate uh, those in the room who are concerned about this as an issue. Uh, I invite you to contribute to the BC's uh, work against uh, domain name abuse, and I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Mason. Lawrence. Yes, so um, my last one will more or less be that um, awareness is good, um, but enforcement is key. And uh, there, is, uh, there is that need for um, ICANN to uh, step up to ensure that, you know, contracts are enforceable. Um, these are real life issues. These are issues that impact uh, people on an everyday basis. And there has to be that trust that, you know, there is somewhere where you can go to and at least you have half of the problem solved, if not majority of the problem solved. Also, I believe that where we have uh, stricter compliance, um, enforceable compliance in terms of, you know, the contracted parties that are involved, uh, there will also, this will also trickle down uh, to uh, the registrants, um, the bad actors, and those who will definitely find it difficult to operate in that space because of the kind of actions that, you know, um, our contracted party colleagues will be uh, forced to step up to. Um, enforcement is key uh, to ensuring that, you know, abuse we're not fully mitigated, is reduced to uh, a very bearable extent. And uh, thanks for having me here. Thank you very much, Mason. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And especially thank you to our audience, both online and in person. It's been a very big pleasure. Um, this is supposed to be a bit of a networking thing. It's one second. A uh, bit of a networking thing. So feel free to find us on LinkedIn, social media of any kind. And, you know, around ICANN, that's where we live. Uh, Nivaldo, you have the final word, actually. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hello, my friends for BC. Uh, I, I would like to take advantage of, of this event to congratulate Mason, Lawrence, and Steve for being the re elected to the BC board, and the Mark for fighting for this DNS abuse case. Okay, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, everyone. And with this very beautiful final words, we wrap this session. Thank you very much.